Wy w sprawozdaniu proszę, żeby była prezentacja. Ale to mogę ci dać do archiwów? Tak. I to jest to się link do sprawozdania. Za to, Ale od tej, bo ja muszę przeczytać ten. Proszę was o interwencję. Niech ktoś powie, zadajcie pytania. My wszystkim piszemy, że mieli prezentację akademicką w tak jak drukujesz takie potwierdzenia, jak dają tak. potwierdzenia. Jak chcesz, dostaniesz. <grym> Teraz może chodź bliżej, nie? Boisz? A on nie się boi. Proszę Państwa, no, już jest dobrze. Troszeczkę... Ladies and gentlemen, you have been able to take a break from me this morning, but um, now... Let's come back to our second panel of today. And that's a very delicate topic. Uh, fleeting, one might say. Uh, how and if the new identity of contemporary Ukraine is uh, being created. And that continues the earlier session of this morning. And it gathers a lot of, th a lot of thoughts that have appeared already. Uh, there's a very simple uh, idea of how to put that in practice, an introduction by Ms. Oksana Zapuszko, who was at the origin of the Three Revolutions projects. Uh, I remember our first conversation about that at a conference in Oxford. So many thanks for um, joining us today. That was Cambridge, yes, it was. It was Cambridge. Uh, so 15 minutes uh, sharp because we want to allow ample time for discussion. I think that it will be heated and I really want it to be distinctive but before lunchtime. Uh, my name is Pavel Kova. With me, the co-chair is Katarina Pryszczepa. The Ukrainian. Uh, which uh, is going to be a sign uh, since our topic uh, in this panel discussion is the identity shift. Uh, my very opting for my lentive, uh, native language will be a designation of this identity shift now uh, 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 occurring in the Ukrainian society uh, as uh, the Ukrainians before 2014, uh, those of my generation and younger, uh, were first and foremost eager to uh, show how wonderfully they can master English. And it's very post-colonial. We can speak English. See, we can speak English. Please treat us as white people. While nowadays, uh, more and more fashionable and prestigious uh, is becoming in the Ukrainian society to boast a good Ukrainian, which is, I would say, a new type of self-assertiveness, self so to speak. So in sake of the loyalty to the topic, uh, I will speak Ukrainian. So, as a, m a matter of fact, I'd like to thank the college and the organizers of this conference for a very good preparation uh, and organizing and gathering such people. This is an intellectual outlet uh, that develops a new discourse what impresses me this year, first of all, is the fact that there is more, there are more contexts uh, around the uh, events in Ukraine. Uh, so, analyzing these events not just as events in Ukraine, but as a, uh, a potential case study. Uh, which uh, is a word I, sh I used in Ukrainian just now, for the general civilizational processes that are occurring uh, around the world right now. After <coughs> Fukuyama and uh, the um, end of history uh, belief, 
we should do something about these conclusions. So yesterday and today, a lot of uh, issues have been raised that I need to uh, summarize. And I also need to rethink um, of what uh, I was going to say. And I have uh, 15 minutes or less than that now. Uh, so here's what I'm going to try to do. First of all, I'd like to specify the definition of what Maidan is and what the post-Maidan society is and what Ukrainian identity is and in general what identity is. Uh, here's what we're f and what we're facing here. And later on I shall attempt to specify it very briefly. Uh, I don't have much time so just briefly outline uh, some points. Um, I'm an observer, a permanent observer, because I am observing 24-7. And what have I observed uh, over the last four years in the Ukrainian society and uh, what it looks like uh, from the point of view of uh, the context of the general civilization? So I have 13 minutes left now. Let me begin with um, the definition that we have been making reference to. What is uh, Maidan and what is post-Maidan? So what are the three Maidans and how they are uh, perceived uh, against the background of what we know about hybrid war? and the problems that uh, democracy is facing uh, in the general civilizational dimension. And for me, this became uh, understandable on the 5th of March, when uh, in 11 cities of the Czech Republic, uh, protesters came out to the street. Uh, And Ukrainians uh, noticed that. Uh, they uh, commented that uh, that was the Czech Maidan. This was not a Maidan. The, these were protest actions against uh, appointments of uh, Mr. Kondracek as the president of the Constitutional Court. Uh, he had been a poli policeman in the 1980s, um, and he according to the illustration law, uh, was not allowed to uh, hold this office. Uh, after 1989, uh, officers of this rank and of officials of uh, the former uh, communist regime um, could not hold high offices in uh, the Czech Republic. So that was against the law, against uh, the act, uh, and it was implemented in an obscene manner, and the authorities were in breach of the law. Uh, and what does the civil society do if the authorities fail to abide by the law? The societies take to the streets in order to reinstate uh, the order to uh, force the authorities to follow the law. This is the mechanism of all the three Ukrainian Maidans. When the state is uh, not capable to of, of ensuring um, that they follow the law and uh, national security, uh, then the society uh, exercises its own law and uh, exercises power in a direct manner. So all the three revolutions, all the three Maidans in Ukraine, if we were to analyze it against that background, in fact, uh, fall within that framework of this definition. And here is where we uh, reach a very interesting and important uh, problem, and that is uh, the relation 
or the attitude of the Ukrainian uh, society towards the Ukrainian state. It is uh, for the second day now that we've been uh, encountering this issue um, about the attitude of the Ukrainian society uh, towards its uh, political elites. To what extent do a political elite of Ukraine represent its society? To what extent are they representative? Timoshenko, Yatsenyuk, Poroshenko. Is uh, Ukraine Maidan or is U Ukraine the scene of Maidan? Maidan does not have its own voice. Uh, it is the stage that uh, speaks for Maidan and the person who holds the microphone. And what is seen outside Ukraine are people who are holding the microphone. But this is not a purely uh, Ukrainian uh, problem. How do we understand that? If this is a logical uh, assumption that was presented by the UK Parliament when the Russian issue was being debated. Uh, occasionally, uh, it was said that uh, we were against sanctions, but the sanctions are not addressed against the Russian nation, but the na Russian authorities, and namely Putin. And herein lies the question about the character Oh, about the crisis of uh, representation in tw the 21st century. To what extent uh, can uh, the Russian nation be isolated from Putin, who has been elected for three terms of office in a legal manner? There was no terror, uh, there was no coup, there was no revolution, uh, but f Putin has been tolerated for three terms of office by the Russian society. So something is incorrect here when it comes to our understanding of uh, representative authorities and power or the character of this, uh, author this type of authority in contemporary societies. Th th this situation is also unclear in Ukraine. For Ukrainians, it's often often has been clear, which wasn't for Poles and Czechs, uh, that uh, uh, Ukraine was not Yanukovych. Uh, they, uh, Ukrainians were, would not identify themselves with, uh, with Yanukovych, even though he was lawfully elected. Why is it easier for Ukrainians to understand that than uh, older nations who have had their states for a longer period of time. Now this situation has been changing over the last four years. What's interesting is uh, to uh, perceive how the uh, state identity is being created in uh, Ukraine, how we are becoming aware that the state is one of the factors of national security, and therefore uh, the Ukrainian army uh, faces a question, what are we fight fighting for? Are we uh, fighting for the state or uh, for Poroshenko, the parliament and the people uh, uh, who are corrupt? Or are we fighting for the Ukrainian state, the Ukrainian flag? And what is the state? Uh, now, this is the most important uh, thing in all this upheaval. Ukraine has always been rich in democratic traditions. Uh, we uh, had uh, references to the Cossacks, to anarchism, to uh, uh, social liberties, to uh, uh, local level uh, bottom-up uh, social movements that have been present uh, for centuries. Uh, when Ukraine was in the hands of uh, other empires, but the nation survived. So everything was all right uh, when it comes to democratic traditions, but uh, not so much when it comes to the uh, term, the state. Uh, so having democratic traditions while not having uh, traditions of the state 
is an interesting clash. Uh, and over the last four years, uh, the uh, political uh, nation has been shaped. Uh, uh, a nation that has its own state. Uh, so when the state, when the nation uh, needs to put order uh, in its relations to the state, that that is a point in time that's worth remembering. When we determine the central term that we're supposed to identify here and that is the identity and what is identity. I suggest uh, that for the remaining 10 minutes that I have, seven, uh, no, five maximum, I suggest that we uh, talk about uh, an image of ourselves, about how we see ourselves. And what brings us into the um, space of culture and that's uh, there's another issue that needs to be raised here we will be discussing that further on about the media and the information war but it's worth uh, saying at this point already uh, because this uh, is something that's not been uh, stated explicitly and clearly when we spoke about hybrid war yesterday and this morning that usually um, this is not appreciated or not uh, noticed outside Ukraine. Ukraine is not in control of its information space. Uh, since the early noughties, uh, uh, since the, what it was called the reform of the media, Ukraine has not been in control, in charge of its television or radio. The only uh, thing that we know about our TV channels and uh, radio channels um, is that uh, they have a significant uh, Russian uh, contribution in terms of capital, which uh, means that uh, uh, Russian editors uh, are uh, um, present. Uh, in one uh, on one occasion, it was uh, there was a successful attempt at. Uh, uh, catching uh, one of those editor, editors, Russian editors, red-handed, and he was overthrown. But that doesn't mean that there aren't Russian influences in the media. So um, uh, saying that uh, Russian media uh, uh, bypass certain issues, well, uh, that is an understatement because the way um, the uh, editorial policies carried out is something that we are quite aware of. Uh, uh, so this is what happened in the decade uh, preceding uh, the events of 2014. So everything that uh, Nikola Kniazhitsky uh, spoke about, all of that was uh, preparing Ukraine for the um, division, uh, trying to create the image of the enemy uh, that differs in uh, various regions. In Lviv, it is the um, the uh, picture of Donetsk as the enemy. In Donetsk, it is the Banderovets. And uh, so uh, everybody knows how the nation was divided and how those maps were created. And the results of the 2013 studies that uh, Mikola Kniazhitsky described in the previous session, uh, this was a nation prepared for a split as a result of a consistent and a systemic information campaign against the state. And here is what I'm uh, claiming. The country was on pause, uh, as if a button hadn't been pressed down completely. You can see that, or you can even compare that to the uh, 1970s because the films from the 1970s were screened. Uh, 
national curricula uh, ended in the 1970s. So you could uh, have an impression that after the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Soviet Union, nothing was uh, created in uh, literature or art in Ukraine. <laughs> so uh, briefly speaking, everything that uh, had was legitimized in any way ended in 1970s. And for 10 years, nothing changed. So uh, the Ukrainian identity that uh, was being prepared at the time successfully uh, matched the post-Soviet state uh, with some indistinct, uh, insignificant characteristics. the east of some kind, Belarus, Ukraine, it all became blurred. Uh, the further you went to the west, the more Ukraine was viewed as an eastern state. And uh, Ukrainian identity as such, and here let me make reference to Timothy Ash that said uh, some time ago that any national identity starts with a weather forecast. Uh, when the whole country can see the map on the television and the map on television uh, as it was in 2013 that was an icon of the Ukrainian identity so I will keep repeating that uh, what we were able to see of the, what most uh, inhabitants were able to see in that map and they were prepared to defend it in 2014. That is uh, quite a puzzle. I have three more points. Uh, I'm getting to the most interesting things and you're taking the floor away. Państwo reagowali żywo, żywo reagowali na to. You have reacted very vividly to the statement, so if you have something important to say, I invite to the table. We still have some free seats. And we are moving forward quite well. Catherine. Well, first of all, a family anecdote. Just uh, one remark, just one remark, one sentence. I, want, I wanted to say about the metaphor concerning uh, today. Uh, Madam Zabuska will present three theses, then we'll have the family anecdote, and then we'll have discussion. I just want to finish off. If until uh, 2013 this weather map was the only symbol of Ukrainian identity, Today, I would propose the following metaphor. Overfilled trains. Ukraine moved on, uh, got off the start, and they all travel intensively. Before the war, it seemed as if we didn't know each other. Traveling in first class, you could have 10 or 15 uh, people there. Today, uh, the train is overfilled and it uh, goes here and there several times. And it seems as if the whole of Ukraine is on the move. Business, uh, human relations, uh, contacts, interactions, uh, resolving. Uh, the effort uh, to uh, integrate Ukraine into a single uh, common space. And today it's difficult to get a ticket for the train. So this metaphor reflects to the new identity of Ukraine, about which I'm ready to talk more, answering questions, and otherwise Pavel will kill me. 
Well, part of my family from Donbass are persons uh, who were uh, relocated there after the so-called exchange of inhabitants uh, from the Lublin area in Poland. Uh, uh, the Poles were afraid of uh, Bandera people uh, massacring them, and uh, this exchange was conducted uh, together with the Soviets. Uh, so let's not overinterpret this situation, but referring to the statement by uh, Mrs. Zabuszko, who mentioned the map and the uh, uh, and the map, well, uh, American uh, media show maps uh, according to language lines. Uh, so the decision on uh, translation of uh, movies uh, into Ukrainian and the subtitles have formed unity in places, in areas where it didn't uh, exist, uh, trying to integrate the uh, Ukrainian and Russian-speaking Ukrainians. The next speaker is invited. Uh, I don't have a problem here. I understand. Uh, you mean the educational laws uh, uh, so as uh, to um, assure the predominance of the Ukrainian language. As far as I know, all these laws caused uh, issues with Ukrainian Hungarians who uh, didn't speak any Ukrainians and used uh, to learn in their own language. So it seems uh, in turn that in Kharkiv, uh, in Odessa, people should know better the Ukrainian language. And all this uh, in accordance with the European uh, standards as uh, admitted by the Venice Committee. But uh, there are still uh, unresolved issues. After the initial years after uh, the Maidan, we were too enthusiastic about the idea of uh, uh, developing a new identity with all these uh, titles in Western press that the nation uh, had a Ukrainian identity and that uh, Putin was even supporting uh, the formation of a uh, Ukrainian identity, but I'd say that it's incorrect, that there have been changes in uh, Ukrainian identity, all these uh, overfilled trains, well, we had uh, such trains before as well, and it didn't uh, help uh, the formation of a Soviet nation, despite the fact that at the time uh, trains were also overfilled. But uh, changes uh, take place above all in the identification uh, of the middle class. And uh, the war with Russia have, has affected um, our uh, urban middle class, uh, a sort of bourgeoisie. So most of the proletariat uh, remained without nationality, without uh, a feeling of national identity, whereas the oligarchy, like uh, the um, noblemen during feudalism, uh, have their own identity. So uh, these activities are not um, very clear. I could quote results of sociological research. Do you believe that the relation between the richest and the poorer classes has changed? Well, we had the illusion that at last uh, the Ukrainian oligarchs have understood that the national interest 
uh, is identical with their own interests, but they uh, don't um, realize national interests, they uh, realize their particular interests. But what about group interests? Well, yes, uh, the middle class has its own identity and its own interests. In all democratic states, um, the middle class forms the nation. Other classes don't need it, neither the lords nor the serfs. Only the urban middle class needs the notion of nationality. And another question to you. Under the conditions of democracy and general suffrage, is it democratic uh, to divide society um, and uh, claim that there is this proletariat which isn't interested in democracy? Well, yes, we do. As uh, writers, uh, we do uh, go to the people and discuss with them. But we need to uh, call things as they are. Uh, you have elected uh, these gangsters and now they rule over you. You have uh, elected them not under pressure of um, uh, coercion, of violence, and now you are uh, escaping to Poland. Mr. Wozniak is a director. Yeah, you have the floor. Well, responding to the question uh, on the educational law in Ukraine, uh, the educational law is uh, the result of the formation of the political nation, not just an instrument. First, there was the French Revolution uh, with its loyalty to the French Republic. And then the French, uh, following that, learned uh, to speak French. At the time, about 30% of today's Frenchmen uh, uh, talked French, uh, whereas the rest uh, uh, spoke regional languages. So there's nothing exceptional about us Ukrainians. So uh, this is not a uh, an appropriate approach, what we hear. Uh, talking about the political nation, uh, when was the German political nation formed? In Bismarck's time, that was very late in history. So German-speaking groups uh, formed uh, a, a political um, community much later. Uh, so the political nation is formed uh, over time, and this, uh, the beginnings of formation of political nations uh, go back to the 19th century. At the beginning of the 20th century, Poland succeeded and it's active, uh, uh, whereas the active process of developing uh, the political nation in Ukraine started in the 1990s. And uh, it's not a given situation, it's a process. Um, France uh, keeps receiving uh, immigrants from Maghreb and their identity keeps um, changing. Uh, the same applies to the United States. It is a long process over time. It's not a single action, an overnight uh, change. So the Ukrainian political nation has a number of aspects, uh, which involves the fact that, for example, uh, you have a well-built, uh, a um, handsome Cossack in Zaporozhye. On the other hand, you in the West, you have the uh, Bandera adherent. Uh, so now our task is to form our identity. So in a few years ahead, uh, this identity will change. And uh, stereotypes have um, an influence here. So uh, then as we look in the mirror, uh, the uh, Ukrainian uh, nation uh, saw itself in the mirror in 1991, then uh, the Soviet stereotypes uh, resurfaced, and then the nation uh, became aware again in uh, 2014. Uh, so when they saw that the stereotypes uh, didn't fit reality, they had to rethink the uh, identity. So this was in 2004 and then again in 2014. People realized that Ukrainian language uh, was used by Ukrainians, but also Russian speakers, 
uh, Tatars uh, and others. So we had to rethink uh, our identity, and this process is in progress. Uh, without that, there will be no political nation uh, of uh, Ukraine. It will simply die. Well, it's important what Mr. Vozniak said, that identity involves uh, symbols uh, versus reality, but also uh, the aspect that when we talk about identity, it's not uh, only a matter of our self-perception in the mirror, but also the TV where we are shown by other nations, by others. So in the context uh, of uh, Ukrainian uh, identity after Maidan, uh, this reality is very important, starting with the educational law, which was uh, to contribute to nation building. It uh, led to uh, conflict with Poland and Hungary, not to mention the law on the uh, national memory. So this external factor, but also the internal, is very significant. Uh, talking here about identity after Maidan, but also after the war or during the war. This is a factor maybe which is crucial because in December 20th, so does it mean that the war forms uh, identity more than the Maidan? Well, possibly yes, because in 2013 uh, they removed Lenin from Hraščatik and put a European flag there and the uh, red and black flag and the Ukrainian flag. And these were the new symbols which the Ukrainians seeking the uh, identity put forward. But then the, the fourth symbol arose that was the president in uniform going to the war front. And it wasn't the uh, deliberate choice. That's how it happened. But talking about the f European flag, or uh, perhaps even about the uh, red and black flag, uh, we uh, have been discussing that there is more talk about it in Poland than in Ukraine. Now, why is this war important? First, because it f forms uh, Ukrainians' uh, identity uh, and uh, the question of ideology. Does Ukraine uh, currently have a specific ideology? Because uh, the whole uh, story started not from uh, identity with uh, EU or uh, with NATO, but from the war. And uh, how much does this ideology uh, make them forget about the European reforms? And again, a very important aspect internationally, uh, perception of this identity understood as perception of the country from outside. Uh, I believe that uh, the image of Ukraine after Maidan Ukraine, which uh, by um, democratic upheaval uh, tried to join the European Union, uh, was much uh, more European, easier to reconcile by uh, the states and inhabitants of EU and NATO states than <coughs> the image of Ukraine uh, uh, during the war. So this uh, vision from uh, January 2014 and uh, from uh, March or uh, July 2014. Well, let's uh, conduct a debate, a discussion. Well, to conclude, I apologize for the names, but uh, Prime Minister Kopacz, when she took power in Poland in 2014, uh, she didn't know what uh, the story was about in Ukraine. When she heard about the war, she went home. She, she closed the door uh, to hide away. And what Putin uh, managed, although he didn't succeed too much in this war, he was able to put uh, Ukraine in a basket uh, with the label problems uh, because of the war, and therefore away from Europe. 
and I believe this uh, plays an important role. Um, the chairman said that uh, you need to uh, use provocation, so I will um, joke a little bit. Yes, it's true that the war forms uh, the Ukrainian political nation, uh, making it unite, and the metaphor is Putin, and therefore it's Putin who is forming the uh, Ukrainian political nation uh, to a large extent. Uh, he is contributing to that. He is causing our consolidation. And uh, the other thesis I'd like to put forward, following the other panel uh, where I was uh, surprised by talk of the symbol which is uh, received uh, by the Polish public uh, to consolidate uh, the Ukrainian nation, that's Stepan Bandera. I have uh, the impression that I am at an, at an OUN uh, gathering uh, promoting Bandera. He is less known in Ukraine that, uh, than the analysts here. He is less quoted in Ukraine than here in uh, this uh, meeting. Uh, our colleague from Manchester will have the floor in a minute. Uh, I don't know whether I should speak Polish or Ukrainian or whatever. Uh, for 20 years now, I have been studying the mobili mobilization processes in Ukraine. Uh, Ola knows exactly how old I am. She's known me since I was a kid. Um, I've been uh, studying this for, for 15 years. And. Uh, Given the studies concerning the Orange Revolution and Maidan, after these studies were published, everybody wants to tell me that it uh, had to do with identity, the ethno-nationalist identity or ethno-linguistic identity. But that is not true, because the data uh, don't re reveal that, don't point to that. I didn't understand why, but now I do, because we are talking about uh, what we think is happening. Uh, we're talking about the symbols that we think exist, but statistics and data show us that uh, this is not the case. These are we speaking about. What are we measuring when we're measuring this? Because we're talking about two different things. And unfortunately, over the last 30 plus years, when we have been doing the, these studies, we have been measuring these things very crudely and very inappropriately. So Oksana started off her call, a conversation by talking about native language. Mm -hmm. My native language is Ukrainian, but I'm obviously an uh, English speaker, and I changed my languages on purpose for this to make this effect. So when we are asking people about native language in Ukraine, we do not know what they are telling us, because most often they are not speakers of Ukrainian. And so what we did with my colleagues, Henry Hale and Tim Colton, of Harvard University is we asked 14 different types of questions about ethnicity, language, and state identity, civic identity, and so on and so forth. And when you start doing the math, you start realizing this is far more complicated than even what our conversation is allowing for today. And I just want you to consider, when we're talking about the building up of an identity post-war, there is no statistical evidence pointing to this fact. There's only evidence pointing to the fact of what Volodya Kulik has found for many years is that there has been, since the mid-1990s, a steady increase of civic identity. And he, you can read his m numerous articles to look at that. Uh, we do not find any change in ethno-linguistic identities or declaration of language even speakers in all of our recent surveys. So <coughs> the war is not actually rebuilding a new identity. It is the continuation of a civic identity that was growing up. So I understand that uh, you don't see, unlike Professor Szeptycki, this distinct change uh, between 2013 and right now. M Mikola, let, let me uh, bring our conversation back to uh, 
the substance, the base, uh, please let's uh, review that, uh, that table. As Olga uh, rightly said, there have been no radical changes, but the revolution and specifically the war has precip precipitated the processes that had existed prior to, the, to it. And on the, uh, in the top table, you can see that over just one year of the war, the support for Ukraine's independence increased more than it had done over the last, the previous 12 years. So the direction had not changed, but the development sped up in all the groups, both uh, Russian-speaking Ukrainian, Ukra Ukrainian-speaking Ukrainians and ethnic Russians. The differences between these groups remain significant still, and you can see that the support for independence is very uh, imp different uh, between the groups. But in each group, the changes are going in the same directions. And what's also important is that over one year, the changes have been similar or even bigger uh, than those in the previous 12 years. So we may be optimistic that Ukraine is advancing towards a certain consolidation, consolidation, but the differences remain, and these differences are visible in the second slide. Here is what these changes look like. Uh, uh, the attitudes before the war and uh, the, that's the dotted line, and the continuous line is after the war. So we can see that all the three groups have moved towards a more pro-Western attitude, but the differences between three different colors, three different groups, uh, remain significant. And that, that is it. Oksana. Oksana. You will be given the floor a couple of times uh, today. I wanted to make reference to what Andre has said, because still, even uh, yesterday, I wanted to take the floor um, regarding this issue. But your censorship did not allow me during the panel about the war, because it gives me shivers every time when I hear that it's not the Maidan, it's just the war, that first, uh, happened the Maidan and then happened the war. Andre, I need to, I am obliged to say it uh, to you because I have been uh, uh, speaking about this and I have written about this for the first time. On the 1st of December 2013, I wrote that it was a war. I wrote a book uh, in Ukrainian, unfortunately. It's a compilation of articles. Uh, about the hybrid war, and I consider Maidan to be a response of the civil society in Ukraine to the attempt of uh, somewhat of a hybrid war and, and the attempt to play the scenario, uh, what later was described as the Russian Spring, because it, in fact, the Russian army was present in Kiev in uh, uh, winter, in uh, December and January. There are some uh, documents, there is some evidence. Uh, nothing has finished, in fact. And uh, Maidan, uh, uh, in fact, uh, represents that. Kremlin scenario, the, 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 the demonstrating that fake war masked as as the Ukrainian crisis. Maidan, uh, in fact, uh, broke down this scenario. I can I can uh, talk about it a lot. Uh, I won't be allowed to. I know, but uh, from this point of view, we do not make such a big dif difference about this uh, between this in our popular. Um, common language. We talk about the Maidan first and then um, the war. No, no, that's not how we uh, describe it. <laughs> we were first attacked on the 30th of November. That was when the students were beaten up uh, uh, 2013, the 30th of November. Uh, a day after that, two million people uh, came out and uh, took to the streets, and this is where it all began. And it's not finished. It began and it continues. 
And this somewhat uh, helps us find the matrix. I want to uh, ask Professor Szeptycki to ask to add uh, his remarks. Let me go back to the topic of identity. In Ukraine, indeed, a, a new form of civil civil identity has been created. It's not purely the Ukrainian ethnic uh, identity, but it's a social, civil um, identity, a solidarity with the Ukrainian state, which is something that Oksana spoke about. She spoke about the self-identification of statehood. You could be both a Jew and a Polish patriot. You could be a Crimea Tatar, but you can be at the same time a Ukrainian pi patriot. Uh, so this is the Republican patriotism. Uh, this uh, opens a huge window of opportunities in Ukraine, which we tend to forget. Uh, so it's a shift from the either-or logic, it's either Hungarian or Ukrainian. We move to a completely different logic, that you can be both Po and a Ukrainian patriot that is loyal towards the Ukrainian state. This situation has changed and changed when, back in 2014, we took a look in the mirror. Indeed, uh, do, would you say that this model has been created already? Well, nothing is given uh, forever. Everything may be uh, returned. In Germany in 1933, it, it, this is what happened. First, you were able to be both a Jew and a national patriot, but after 33, you weren't able to be both. Uh, just two points, uh, at least. I think that certain differences that have appeared uh, result from the way we understand identity. That is a vast concept, and we could organize a separate panel about what we understand as identity. That, uh, secondly, uh, in terms of continuity, yes, it exists. But uh, what is a different matter is uh, what I uh, described as the uh, perception from outside. Still, uh, the social protest, political crisis, or however we call it, um, and I'm referring to the events uh, uh, that started um, on uh, the 30th of November until the 21st of February. Uh, but what followed afterwards, uh, at least from the external point of view, uh, maybe Ukrainian as well, but you would be better positioned to describe that. I, um, I fear Oksana slightly. Uh, but it, in any case, this uh, had a slightly different dynamic. And um, in particular, and this is what I want to say once more, in my view, the um, image of the Ukraine of Maidan, uh, the Nibanska Sotnia, the uh, social protest, it uh, suited much better, at least uh, in Central Europe, the image that we have of ourselves. There was a very active support of the Polish society for Maidan because we were able to find there in our own traditions. The, this was the generation of the, of the, the children of the solidarity people uh, who had tried doing similar things uh, for uh, for themselves, when uh, but when the war appeared, when cyborgs appeared, then the same people, to a large extent, just became helpless. And I'm talking about what happened here, um, because this was an experience that uh, we just weren't able to handle. We didn't know what to do about it. So uh, it is from that point of view that I'm uh, uh, speaking about this shift perceived from outside of the Ukrainian identity. So Maidan was a revival of the hopes that we had in 2004 and 5, 
um, that Ukraine was going to take the um, uh, Central European path of development, however we understand it, but the, pro the, the war, the continuing war, in fact, uh, um, uh, negates that. And what's <coughs> symptomatic for me is uh, the extent to which uh, in Poland uh, there was interest um, in the situation in Ukraine. That happened until August, uh, September 14, because when the mass invasion followed in Ukraine, Polish media and Polish political class realized that it was not going to be a success story, that it was going to last for years, and therefore there's no point talking about it uh, every day. Thank you very much for this remark. Ladies and gentlemen, we have some time for um, interventions from the floor. I, I have two uh, requests for the floor. I have the following question. I'm sorry, but we didn't get the text. Concerning the political nation as referred to by Mr. Wozniak, my question is an accelerated formation of Ukrainian a political nation uh, caused by the Maidan and the war requires us uh, to be responsible. Uh, I'm pointing at the Ukrainian ethnic uh, nation and uh, the question of uh, the Ukrainian language in the electronic media. So uh, the Ukrainian nation should behave responsibly, uh, and this has another phase, uh, that's uh, accountability of the state, of the government. So today we are working on Ukraine's uh, constitution with regards uh, to the autonomy of Crimea. So it is meant to be a national and uh, territorial autonomy with the right uh, of the Tatars for self-identification. And uh, these forms of uh, accountability are not identical. Well, the discussion on uh, Ukrainian identity is fascinating. Uh, my American optimism is very important for me personally. So, for hope, for Ukraine, for the form in which Ukrainian patriotism ultimately takes place, along the lines that Pantaras suggested. Two examples of why I am hopeful about Ukraine. First, the Eurovision Song Contest that <coughs> Jamala won. I was in Kiev when it happened. She's a Ukrainian Tartar. She was speaking, uh, she's a Muslim woman speaking about, uh, her song was about 1944. And she was embraced by Ukrainian society as a Ukrainian hero. The second, that is an example of civic patriotism, not narrow nationalism. Secondly was the open letter of the Ukrainian Jewish community to, to uh, Vladimir Putin, where they basically said, we have different political views among ourselves, but we are Ukrainian patriots, back off. We don't need your help. This was, given the complexities of, of <coughs> Ukrainian history, this is a big deal. Both of them are big deal, big deals. Ukrainians embracing a Tartar woman as a, Ukraine, a symbol of successful Ukrainian culture and the Ukrainian Jewish community planting the flag and saying, no, we stand right here with Ukraine. There are other signs, human beings, right? I didn't spend all these years in Poland to pick up nothing of Catholic uh, 
uh, social thought. Worse, there are worse possibilities, but there is a good possibility that is still alive, and I find that this discussion reflects it, and I am still hopeful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador. Next, next voice, please. Floor is yours. <coughs> Hello, my name is Molovan Anton from Romania. I'm a student. So um, in this process of, let's say, building up a new identity, um, Kiev uh, took some controversial decision, as we see, and the reaction of uh, Hungary is the best example or, uh, of Romanian officials. So we have the new education law, uh, especially artic uh, Article 7 of it, uh, and it triggers a set of um, consequences, short-term consequences. As we've seen, uh, Hungary uh, used his veto, and uh, he blocked the uh, NATO-Ukraine commission. Then... Um, um, he asked for o OSCA uh, mission because of the tension in the trans in Zakarpatia, and uh, a less debated uh, decision that was taken recently was the was that one. Uh, constitutional court uh, court declared the um, uh, regional language, the law of a reg regional language, uh, as uh, unconstitutionally. So in this context, how do you see uh, this, um, um, this decision could affect the process of Europeanization of Ukraine or not? Thank you so much. Two more questions and we will come back to the panel. I feel like this conversation, and I felt this yesterday when we were talking about um, uh, civil society in Ukraine, I feel like it's ignoring a, a huge proportion of Ukrainians. Um, like today we had this, uh, so it's middle class and Lumpen, and there seems to be this attitude that Lumpen are not worth considering. But the vast majority of Ukrainians would, I guess, fall into that category. Um, and also, we're talking about speaking more Ukrainian, about um, uh, developing a Ukrainian identity in opposition to Russia. Um, but Oksana mentioned train journeys. Um, if you take any train journey in Ukraine, particularly going to the east, but not only, if you look at what people are watching on their um, iPads or whatever, they are watching Russian serials, those ones that are banned now. If you listen to what people are talking about, um, they're taking an anti-Maidan position, they're taking a pro-Russian position, they're talking about their family in Russia. They don't fit into this modern Ukrainian identity, which I feel like is all that people are talking about. Um, I would just like to see more recognition that it's, it's more complicated, I guess is what I'm trying mm -hmm. to say. Thank you for your reflection. And last voice, please. Dzień dobry, Maciej Piotrowski, Instytut. Maciej Piotrowski from the Liberty Institute. Uh, I see at the table mostly, apart from uh, people analyzing the formation of national identity in Ukraine, also the protagonists, the creators of the political nation. So my question would be, how do you perceive uh, the achievements and uh, failures of the Ukrainian intelligentsia, uh, the educated class, uh, in forming uh, and shaping uh, the Ukrainian nation? Uh, let me add to this question, what is the attitude towards violence or coercion? describing the new Ukrainian uh, national. Well, comparing to the middle class is not sufficient to describe a modern Ukrainian. Uh, well, uh, maybe you are trying to develop a value system around which the Ukrainian uh, nation is forming. So after this panel, uh, what points uh, we could uh, the Jews from this panel as crucial for formation of the Ukrainian 
national identity. Well, and I will ask uh, Mrs. Zabłuszko uh, to conclude and sum up. Mr. Wozniak first. Uh, well, certainly three issues. First of all, the, the political reality to the east of Poland. It doesn't uh, reflect your approach to to yourselves. Ukraine is not Poland, not because, well, uh, we are proud in a way, but Poland was formed uh, as a nation state with only one nation, unnatural, formed uh, because of the violence on the parts of Soviets and uh, Germany. So Ukraine has, is in a different situation and has to form a society more like the French or American one. Many nations and uh, many miracles as uh, uh, the uh, pre-war Poland was described. And in this uh, way, today's Ukraine is more like uh, pre-war Poland. And uh, the uh, identity with the state is more important than uh, identity with uh, the nation. And now uh, the second uh, issue, which concerns what Mr. Chubarov asked. Uh, the formation of the new political nation uh, in Ukraine uh, involves not only the local Ukrainians, but also uh, Crimean Tatars. It's not a large nation in terms of numbers, but it's the Crimea is their territory. And uh, our politicians are uh, not prepared to, to explicitly say that, that it's their land, the, the Tatars' land. So I'm not as optimistic uh, as you might claim, we recognize uh, that we supposedly recognize uh, the Crimea as the land of the Tatars. Uh, so our success will depend on, the, on whether we will assure our partners that they can participate in the formation of uh, our nation, including the uh, Crimean Tatars, providing them with a future or vesting them with the future. So uh, f the formation of the Crimean Tatar autonomy with uh, competences which are necessary and which they will be able uh, to put in place uh, at a certain stage, uh, which might uh, develop into a separate uh, statehood. Uh, today, nation states are dying, and the European Union is uh, um, an example of that. On the other hand, we see the backlash in Poland or in Hungary. So today, uh, it is important for us uh, to assure a future for the Crimean um, Tatars. But our authorities are uh, fearful, and they don't uh, talk about it. I live in the west of Ukraine. And therefore, uh, uh, the language law and the uh, Romanian and the Polish and the Hungarian problem. Uh, you see that Poland had nothing against uh, teaching uh, in other languages in schools. And today, uh, the struggle of Romanian and Hungarian uh, governments is not uh, to assure that uh, Romanians or Hungarians in Ukraine uh, uh, should know their um, native languages. Their uh, objective is that uh, they shouldn't learn Ukrainian. So as uh, so when a girl in a Hungarian uh, village doesn't know Russian or Ukrainian, she is not able to uh, make a career in Ukraine. She can only be suitable for export to Hungary uh, to emigrate there. 
or uh, to remain an object for future resentment <coughs> with regards to the effects of the First and Second World War. My uh, granddaughter goes to school where there are no uh, language issues. Well, I have a colleague who joined the army who feels Polish. He identifies himself as a Pole, but he fought for Ukraine. Well, there is no problem with that. Well, let me add in this context, referring uh, to other statements. I'll uh, answer in English. In law on languages contradicts Ukraine's uh, European integration. Not a single European country has such a broad educational opportunities as Ukraine for minorities. Believe me, if you give me example of any other country in, in Europe who, which offers as much as Ukraine offers to the minorities, please do it. Secondly, uh, what do you know about Yanukovych's law on languages which was cancelled? The law was uh, absolutely illegal. The law was anti-constitutional because it stipulated that uh, any other region, so-called regional language could be used instead of state language, not in parallel, but instead of, which, mea which meant that uh, half of population of Ukraine were discouraged to learn Ukraine language just because it was not necessary. It was absolutely uh, obsolete. Uh, now, uh, second point. Um, Indeed. I have uh, presented a simplification uh, talking about the middle class and the proletariat. Uh, I should have uh, defined it differently. So I'll try to rephrase it. As any other country, we have civil society and non-civil society. Uh, the majority is uh, the civil uh, society um, propagating the revolution, and we have the non-civil part, which votes for people like Kuchma and others. And this process is in progress. We still have three opportunities. Can't hear the speaker. Uh, well, maybe what I have to say is not so interesting, but. And I think people often forget uh, the other new members, right? Which this country was and is still referred to as. Um, think to Estonia or think to Latvia. Who had who who were actually in in European courts? It was argued that they are abusing the human rights of um, a large portion of their citizens by denying them citizenship because they didn't know Estonian or Latvian. Yeah, and that was an ongoing process, and they did not resolve this, and they entered as full uh, EU members. So I think when there is a will to include certain countries into the EU, it happens when there is not and there is opposition. So the, the argument against minority protection did not work in the past. So I just, even if I agree more with what um, Nicola just said. But on the intelligentsia, and, and this is, I think my father is more part of that group of, <laughs> and, um, but what I'm going to say, and this is in, in no offense to anyone here because I, I have the most utter respect for the people sitting beside me, but I think the intelligentsia has uh, often um, referred or de focused on opinions or maybe what they would like to see, what they would hope to see, and frustrations, right? And we have to base a lot of what we say publicly on empirics, and that is really important when voices such as yours, and Nicola does this all the time, referring to, to empirics, that the weight of what you say carries and resonates throughout not only all of Ukraine, but also 
beyond, and that's incredibly important. And so I would just, in that vein, I would just like to highlight that next week we are publishing a special issue on Ukrainian <coughs> identity in post-Soviet <laughs> affairs, yeah? Um, with uh, Gwendolyn Sasa and Henry Hale, I'm the editor of it. And we have Volodymyr Kulik and, and many others, Oksana Shevel, Dominique Arel, <laughs> and many others contributing to it. And I think this is going to reshape the discussion, the empirical discussion on identity. And I would th like to now move to who are the new, the vast majority of Ukrainians. And I thought that was very important what you said. Um, the new Ukrainian is civic. And the new Ukrainian has a very strong civic identity and that has developed over the last uh, few decades. Um, and that is in the East and that is in the West, but there are versions of what it means to be a citizen is very different, yeah? But that's the one thing that unites. Uh, the median Ukrainian is increasingly, not maybe uh, the majority, but it's becoming more so the case, that the main values of Ukrainian citizenship correlate very highly with liberal values and belief that democracy is a good system for Ukraine. So those are also the people who tend to have higher civic uh, identity um, in, in various statistical analyses, not only our own. And finally, the one thing that um, it, it creates, a, 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 maybe shapes or is a driver of different attitudes, whether it's to foreign policy, to the conflict, to the war, and, and that's by and large regionalism, always. Regionalism, you can make language and you can make ethnicity disappear in every single statistical model, okay? You cannot make region disappear no matter what you do. So if region is not ethnicity and language, then we must ask ourselves what it is. And this lends back to the class issue. Region is about those who, uh, unfortunately, this overlaps with region, socioeconomic inequalities. Those who feel they are losers of transition are less likely to feel they are citizens of Ukraine, and they are less likely to also have adhere to certain values that you've asked about. Bardzo dziękuję. Bardzo dziękuję. Mamy przy stole świetnych badaczy. Thank you very much. We have excellent uh research as analysts at table. Mr. Szeptycki, two comments, uh, one serious and brief, the other longer and more serious. Talking about the trains. Just one short anecdote, perhaps. Um. Okay, second point then. We've got time reserved for lunch. We can shorten it, but we won't be able to extend uh, later on because we've got the movie screening. All right, the remark then. Uh, a question was asked about the values that the identity is supposed to be based upon. And let me go back to what we spoke about earlier, myth versus reality. Identity is not just about symbols, but certain norms. Uh, and I think that if we were to draw that map to try and do it, then uh, certainly what would uh, have to be found there is the democracy and the fight for freedom, uh, independence and the fight for independence, definitely the threat from Russia, definitely the values and the drive towards the European Union, uh, not so clear about NATO. But one problem arises, uh, and we uh, haven't discussed that in the context of identity, but we have discussed that in against other backgrounds, and it's very important. While uh, between the fight and uh, for independence and the threat from Russia, there is a certain positive correlation, and I think that is a contribution to the identity and a positive one. Uh, on the other hand, however, uh, between that declarative symbolic uh, drive for towards Europe and building Europe on the field, there is no correlation. Uh, it's the issue of corruption, the transitional justice, etc., and uh, that is uh, the definitely a weakness of the newly born identity. It's definitely not the post-Soviet identity as understood uh, in uh, uh, the 1990s in Ukraine and Belarus, but it's not yet the European identity uh, as what happened 20 years ago in Poland. But is there a model European uh, identity? I don't think there is one. But I think what resounds uh, especially well in Natalin here is, is that 20 years ago, uh, 
we didn't just talk about going towards Europe uh, here in Poland, but people, uh, also those related to this place here, uh, created that identity in mid uh, 90s before we even entered the EU. And I think that is a weakness outside this regional uh, dimension, perhaps not a weakness, but a specificity. And I think that is the issue ha here. Thank you very much. And uh, concluding remarks now from Oksana Zabushko. Uh, several points so that we leave this place remembering the, the most important points. Please uh, use your microphone. So many issues have been raised here that we should have a new conference to be able to answer them all. Uh, that's why let me just uh, stick to a number of issues uh, and limit my intervention to uh, some conclusions. Uh, so what I wanted to say uh, initially, <coughs> starting with values, around what values is the Ukrainian society integrating and why, despite all the uh, ambiguities and uh, the imperfect political discourse around Ukraine, not just outside it, uh, but also inside Ukraine. It's not per perfected yet, and that's our main issue here in the country. The level of and the character of this thought, this reflection, there, is, there are no playing fields for, for reflection. There are no media where uh, debates could be held. There are no points for clarifying this uh, discourse. Um, that uh, could mirror the Ukrainian society um, uh, instead of uh, taking to the streets every uh, 10 years to, to see how uh, numerous it is. In any case, the values that uh, uh, consolidate society Well, w speaking to all the audiences that I've uh, spoken to over the last uh, four years, I could see that everybody has agreed that uh, these values very well lie within the structure of what we may refer to as the European identity. Rome is law. Paris is the uh, Human Rights Declaration. Uh, is the isolation of uh, uh, secular um, and religious power. Uh, it's a metaphor for the uh, division between uh, secular and church power. There is no uh, symphony between them. So Rome, Paris, Canossa, uh, law, liberty and spiritual liberty describe uh, more or less the horizon of values of the contemporary uh, Ukrainian. Um, and here is uh, what I wanted to emphasize because I wasn't very uh, specific about it earlier. Uh, I have remarked that this uh, regionalization that uh, took place prior to Maidan, the division uh, into the pro-Russian East uh, uh, with the pro-Russian um, citizens, second-class citizens, as they were described. And then the question was asked whether people who were pro-Russian traveled to the East 
What was most pa patriotic, what is most patriotic to me in terms of their sentiments are cities along the line in the east, from Kharkiv uh, to through Zaporozhia to Mariupol. These are the uh, towns that have encountered a realistic threat and that uh, stood up to aggression, where there was bloodshed, where people are now happy uh, not to be experiencing what Donetsk is experiencing, that uh, uh, they don't have the Russian army uh, knocking on their doors. And inside it, there, the nation is mobilized, motivated. These are the towns that are finding their new non-Soviet identity and their history uh, is being built there. All right, and another point, going back to um, the state, a lot was said about loyalty towards the state. Uh, this loyalty towards the state um, is uh, ordering us to trigger memory. Let's remember that uh, the winner of that war is uh, of this war is the person who has the the, the longest term memory. So that's the memory reactor. Um, the notion of a hundred year war was created and associations have been made to the uh, Ukrainian uh, People's Republic uh, to the events of 1918-21. And the um, integration of the uh, Ukrainian Socialist uh, um, Republic, can this uh, be treated as Ukraine? That's a separate question. But uh, the Ukrainians of the post-Maidan era are no longer prepared to accept what was said to them um, earlier. I have an announcement. So uh, Rome, Paris, Canossa, uh, reactor of memory, we're approaching the end. I'd like to thank uh, the interpreters for their patience. But uh, I don't want to mislead you. We now have lunch. Uh, then we have the final discussion. We're approaching the end. And as the agenda uh, stipulates, we may perhaps shift the times by perhaps 10 minutes. Uh, we will rearrange the other room. Uh, lunch uh, and then discussion. We have all the film creators here with us. And we will have an interesting uh, film uh, evening. Now let's take lunch.